Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, One Chance Relaying webinar, hastily arranged uh, to discuss the changes to the calculation of damages under Ogden 9. I'm Paul Stagg. Uh, with me are Andrew Spencer, Christopher Pasch, and Francesca O'Neill. Um, I just want to start uh, with a hard luck story. And uh, we probably need at this point the Radio 2 music for our tune or whatever it is. Um, Last Thursday, Lisa Doby and I presented another webinar on calculating dependency claims under the Fatal Accidents Act 1976. Uh, and I gave guidance on calculating multipliers of dependency claims under Ogden 7. Um, and then the very following day, Ogden 8 was published. Um, so that was uh, my initial reaction uh, to that. Uh, but it's clearly uh, an event of importance. Uh, and so therefore, we have hastily arranged this webinar uh, to try to give you some guidance to the major changes uh, under Ogden 8. Um, we do of course have the question and answer facility uh, which you can access by clicking on your menu, the Q&A icon, and if you have questions we'd be grateful if you would uh, just type them into uh, that so everyone can see them. Uh, we are going to be attempting to answer your questions during the seminar uh, and then we're planning to publish our slides on our website uh, with copies of the questions in, and answers included, uh, which we hope will be helpful for everybody. Um, so uh, on, on with uh, the talk then, and uh, we've got, I'm just going to do a quick overview of the changes. Uh, there are eight new tables, so they're all renumbered, or a lot of them are renumbered, which is just going to confuse us all. Uh, for male and female, loss of earnings to ages 68 and 80, the significance of 68 obviously being that is now state pensionable age for many people and the age at which many people will now be retiring if you believe the government um, that they're not going to raise it any further which they probably will within a few years uh, and then we've got loss of pension from those ages as well so eight new tables in total uh, we've got a set of additional tables which are only available uh, on an excel spreadsheet and i'm going to be looking very closely at those and how they can how you can use those to make your task of calculating damages easier uh, and the explanatory notes, which have always been a feature of Ogden, have now been uh, much significantly expanded and cover a, a range of new topics which they didn't uh, reach before. So uh, that we'll be looking at those in some detail as well. So we've got four talks. I'm going to cover the additional tables and how to use them. Um, Andrew will cover contingencies other than mortality. Um, Chris will cover impaired life expectancy and then finally Francesca will look at fatal claims. I'm just going to touch at the brief at the end of my talk on some of the other innovations in the explanatory notes which are uh, not so much concerned with calculation of damages but you might find useful in offering you some guidance on different areas of practice. So what are these additional tables? Um, uh, they're available only in Excel format. Uh, they haven't been published in PDF as yet. Um, and uh, you can download them uh, from this address uh, on the internet. Um, you have notes on their usage uh, in one tab, and then there are six Excel spreadsheets. There's, um, that should be negative 0.25% for loss of earnings. Uh, that's equivalent to tables three to 18. There's a negative 0.75 um, uh, pair of tables. That's, that's for Scotland where that's the statutory discount rate. And then a 0% set of tables, um, which you can use for life expectancy, though personally, I think it's probably easier just to use tables one and two. So that graphic shows what you've got at the bottom of the uh, uh, spreadsheet. You've got these different tabs and that shows what you can click on to find the relevant um, uh, table. As you can see, You've got tables for males and females. So how to use them? The rows in the spreadsheet um, are, represent the age at the date of trial, so the present age, uh, and the columns in the spreadsheet represent the age to which the multiplier runs. Um, so you've got that rubric at the top left of the spreadsheet which explains that in detail, and you can see we're looking at the male spreadsheet at minus, two, uh, minus 0.25%. Uh, and you can see the top left of the table there. Um, so if you had, for example, um, a, a, a five-year-old at the date of trial and you wanted to multiply to nine, you'd go across and find a multiplier of 4.02 4 in the right-hand column. 
So if um, you, if the end date for your multiplier for the period you're concerned with has its own table, you can either use the table in the Ogden tables or you can use the additional tables. Um, so take the example of Andy, who's age 24, with loss of earnings to retirement age of 68. In the additional tables, you can see there, uh, I've highlighted the relevant entry. Uh, you can see his age at the date of trial on the left-hand side, 24, and his retirement age of 68 at the top of the screen. Uh, and then we can see the multiply given is 45.13. And in table 11, if we look at that, uh, in the published version of the tables, you get exactly the same multiplier. Uh, from table 11 um, at which is the multiplier for loss of earnings to the age of 68 uh, and you can see in the left hand side um, Andy's age of 24 and again the same multiplier so you can use either if you've got um, a, a, a figure going to the same age as one of the tables where they really come into their own however is that the additional tables are much easier to use if you have um, uh, if your end date doesn't have its own special table so take a case of Barry. Barry is 55. His partner is seven years younger than him and, sh and she wants to retire at the age of 60. So Barry will be retiring when he's 67. Uh, and it's an easy task to find uh, the, the right multiplier for Barry uh, because we've now got effectively a, a, a table for age 67. So we don't have to, um, uh, to interpolate between table, the table for 65 and the table to 68. We can simply just select the multiplier at the 67. And so that's the real benefit of the additional tables is the reduced need for these tedious calculations, particularly for carrying them out manually. I always carry them out using Excel, but, um, uh, but now uh, that's much reduced. I should say, by the way, that the additional tables are calculated taking account of mortality risks. Um, so they uh, do uh, to like, like tables um, 3 to 34, as they now are, uh, they take account of the mortality risks arising up to during the period in question. So to give two examples, it was previously necessary to, ca uh, to carry out complex calculations to work out the correct multiplier. So two examples, Caden, age 21, with a retirement age of 62, and Della, age 42, who was planning to retire at 58. Um, the first method that the, uh, that the explanatory notes give uh, was previously recommended, uh, was the previously recommended method in Ogden 7. It's a very involved calculation. Basically, what you do is you um, work out the gap between um, the claimant's actual uh, or, 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 or the, uh, the end period and the lower table. That's to say here, for example, just to take the example on the left, uh, he's going to retire at 62 and the lower table is, is to age 60. Uh, so there's a gap of two years and you'd reduce 20, the age of 21 to 19 to give a deemed age. Then you get a multiplier for 19 and then you do the same for the, um, for the higher table. That's 65. Uh, 65 minus 62 is 3. So you add three years to the age to give 24 uh, and the multiplier for that uh, is 42.10. And then you perform a complex piece of maths on it. Uh, to get to that table. Now that's all very well if you're using Excel and you've got the right formula such as there, uh, but obviously that's very tedious indeed to do uh, manually. Uh, so I always use the, the slightly simplified method, uh, which is uh, to just to uh, work out, uh, just to add to the, um, uh, to the lower of the two multipliers or subtract from the higher of the two multipliers uh, to get the gap between the two. Uh, that's said to be the simplified method in Ogden uh, 8. Um, that, although, that, although that formula looks as complicated as the previous one, in fact, it's a good deal more simple to work out manually. Um, but uh, in any case, now we have the additional tables. It is simplicity itself. And the, we're told that the actuaries who contributed to the tables say this is the most accurate method. So it's recommended for use. Uh, and this is definitely the simplest method because you simply go to the additional tables and you take the multiplier. Easy. Um, so you can, if you look at those figures of 42.32 and 16.13, if we then step back uh, a couple of slides, uh, you can see that the simplified method uh, was 0 0.01 out uh, for the um, uh, for uh, Caden 
uh, but it was exactly the same uh, for Delia. And then, uh, again, the difference from the previously recommended method is pretty much min uh, minimal. So there's very little difference between these, but obviously if you've got a high value plane, it may make enough of a difference. But the main uh, reason to use additional tables is uh, ease of use, in my opinion. Now, of course, uh, the claimant's age at trial will not usually be a whole number. Um, so if you want exact calculation, you're still going to need to interpolate between ages. So take Emma. She's uh, age 54.34 years at trial, roughly, uh, roughly 54 and th uh, four months. Uh, and she's going to retire at the age of 62. So we know that we're going to have to interpolate between uh, 50, 45 and 46 on the additional tables. But what we're not going to have to do is interpolate the end age between 60 and 65, because double interpolation is about four times as complicated if you're doing it manually. So how to interpolate between the ages? Well, you've got on the additional tables, uh, you can see the multipliers there for, for uh, uh, from age 45 and 46 to the age of 62. Uh, and this is what I've done on the Excel spreadsheet to demonstrate um, uh, the, the calculation. Uh, you, round, um, the pe you round the period or you round the age down and then take a multiplier uh, for that age. You round it up and take a multiplier for that age. And then you apply the formula, which isn't too fiddly, uh, which is set out there. And that gives you your multiplier from the age of 45.34, which is 16.73. Not too complicated. Retirement multipliers, the exact explanatory table on this. And the, it suggests that they could be worked out just with the additional tables. But it's hard to see how. Now, uh, it seems that the right methodology is, is just this. Uh, first of all, you calculate your life multiplier and using table one or two is appropriate. Then you calculate your multiplier to retirement using the additional tables, and then you simply deduct the earnings multiplier from the life multiplier, and that gives you a retirement multiplier. So going back to our case of Emma, uh, we can now try and calculate a retirement multiplier from her, uh, for her, and so uh, we're calculating first the life multiplier using the uh, simple uh, methodology recommended earlier. Uh, that gives you a life multiplier of 44.45, and then we just deduct the um, retirement multiplier, which you can see there, and that gives you your retirement multiplier of 27.72. Okay, um, quite frequently, of course, you're going to have a case where you have to split up the earnings multiplier. That will be particularly the case if you are uh, concerned with somebody who may have promotion or may change careers dur during their working life. So we've got Finn here, age 31.77 uh, years and he, he is said to he's working his way up the corporate ladder he has chances of promotion at those ages he'll retire at 68 and you're planning to use different multiple cans to, uh, to, uh, during these periods to reflect the chances of promotion and he'll retire at 68 so how do we do this this looks complicated but again if you're if you're automating it using excel or a similar um, program it's actually very straightforward indeed so the first thing we do is we do a table uh, with the start with the starting age and the age at the end of each period uh, and we then uh, round down the age uh, the age of 31 and we take um, the uh, and we take so a year uh, we take a multiplier for um, uh, for, for four years from um, 31 to 35 which is that figure there uh, and then we do similarly um, uh, from 32 to 35, which is uh, this figure um, here. Uh, and then we work it through. And uh, to actually work then to work out the multiplier from uh, from A to the end of the period in each case. So from 31.77 to 35 here, the 31.77 to 68 here. Um, you first of all multi work out what those multipliers are by this by this interpolation process. And then to get these numbers, um, you take uh, the f multiplier for that period, uh, and then you deduct, um, and, and, and then and then and then you're you're just completing your interpolation process here. These figures then feed down into here, 
And so to get to, to, get to your multipliers that you need, um, you, first, for the first period, you're simply using the same figure. And then you are deducting um, the multiplier to the end of the period from the previous multiplier. So 9.3 minus 4.24 gives you 5.06. 17.45 minus 9.3 gives you 8.15. And you repeat this process all the way down um, uh, and that gives you your slices there. So um, uh, uh, it sounds complicated, but if you automate it, uh, simplicity itself. Um, you can also use these multipliers for care support and services claims. You frequently get care experts saying, that the claimant would have either needed the same type of care by the time that the claimant reaches a certain age or would no longer have been able to do DIY gardening or, and so on by the time that they reach a certain age. So here what you can do is you can use your additional tables to calculate your multiplier to that age and um, this is more accurate than what the, than the previous methodology which is to use what was table 28 now tw table 26, 36 rather, uh, because the, this methodology will take account of mortality and tables 35 and 36 do not take account of mortality risks. So that deals with the additional tables. Just dealing with um, some other new commentary uh, briefly that you need to know about. Uh, there's a section on young claimants and loss of earnings at paragraphs 37 and 39 of the explanatory notes. That simply says, methodology find age when the claimant would have started work uh, use a multiplier from that age to retirement and then you use table 35, formerly table 27, uh, to work out what the effect of the delay in those uh, receipts of those earnings is. So that's simple enough. Uh, pension loss, there's a section at, um, in the explanatory notes, there's nothing new about multipliers but it does summarise the approach to pension loss quite helpfully and gives examples. Uh, and then finally there's a section on periodical payments. Uh, that says nothing about multipliers, but it does suggest an approach to cases where loss of earnings are compensated by uh, periodical payments. I've never actually had such a case. I've only ever dealt with cases where care and case management are compensated by, uh, by periodical payments. Uh, but you, uh, your experience may be different. And if you have a loss of earnings claim that you think is appropriate for periodical payments, you may want to look at those notes. So uh, that's my uh, talk done, uh, and I shall therefore hand over to Andrew. Thanks very much, Paul. Well, um, if I succeed in sharing my screen, which I'm going to uh, try and do now, then um, you'll see that I'm talking about contingencies other than mortality. And um, people may or may not be relieved to hear that uh, there's actually not going to be any maths in my section. Um, well, Contingencies other than mortality has been changed quite a lot um, in Ogden 8 and um, in the chairman's introduction um, it goes as far as to say that this section has been completely overhauled. Um, the main changes that have been put in, uh, well the most prominent one is to the definition of disability and Ogden 8 now um, has a definition of disability which references the Disability Discrimination Act um, and not the Equalities Act, and um, that the uh, disability must affect either the type or the amount of work that the claimant can do. And as we'll get on to, it's clear that um, this is um, an attempt to actually make the threshold for being disabled for Ogden purposes higher than, than perhaps people have thought it was before. Um, there have also been some changes to the reduction factors themselves, um, how education is dealt with, and also to reflect um, the discount rate. And then there's been some, um, some guidance put in about when and how to actually adjust the table A to D reduction factors in a particular case, uh, which is all potentially quite controversial. And before we get on to these, um, there is um, a distinction which is uh, put in in Ogden 8, which is quite important, I think. And um, this is a distinction between the wage and the employment effect of disability. And um, the guidance explains that um, where you have a disabled claimant, then the result of their dis disability uh, may well be that their earnings are actually going to be reduced 
perhaps because of a reduction in working hours, missing out on a promotion, or perhaps um, having access to less well remunerated jobs than otherwise. Well, this is the wage effect, and this is taken into account in the multiplicand. And it's not the same as the employment effect. Um, the employment effect um, recognises that um, a disabled person may have longer periods where they're out of work. Uh, it may take them longer to find the job. They may lose their job uh, and they may be more likely to take early retirement than somebody who isn't disabled. And it is this employment effect that's dealt with in tables A to D, not the wage effect. And the guidance says these are two distinct effects and it's not double counting to deal with them separately. So in a particular case, you may have a reduction in multiple account because of the wage effect, and then also uh, a significant reduction from tables A to D to take into account the employment effect. So going back then to the key changes uh, in contingencies other than mort mortality, as I said, I think the most prominent is the definition of disability. So Ogden 8 says, for a claimant to be disabled, there are three requirements. So firstly, to have an illness or a disability which has or is expected to last for over a year or which is a progressive illness. So that's requirement one. Then it also requires to have the DDA definition of disability being satisfied. And that is to say that the disability has a substantial adverse effect on the person's ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities. Then the third requirement is that the impairments uh, limit either the kind or the amount of paid work that the claimant can do. And all three of these need to be met for the person to be disabled for the purpose of Octon 8. Um, looking at the DDA definition, um, there are two words in there which um, need um, some explanation. So these are the words uh, for a substantial adverse effect and normal for normal day-to-day -day activities. So normal day-to-day -day activities, the guidance says, these are the sorts of activities that are carried out by most people on a daily basis, and that includes work activities. Substantial uh, has a meaning which the guidance note suggests has changed over time in, in our understanding, essentially with the threshold for what's substantial being brought a bit lower. Um, and so it's quite useful to look back at the DDA to see what it said about a substantial adverse effect. And the DDA included um, non-exhaustive guidance about um, what this meant. And um, this was available to people who were um, people who were responding to the surveys on which the, um, the research on, on which this is all based on. And um, it's not clear the extent to which survey respondents actually referred to this guidance. And the guidance isn't supposed to be exhaustive. So these two things are quite important um, caveats. And the guidance was actually dropped from the EA as being too restrictive, but it's back in the frame now. Um, it's worth looking at. I'm not going to look at every single part of it because we'd be here all day, but they're here on the slides. Uh, so, um, in terms of mobility, there are mobility examples, which you can see here on the screen. And we will make these slides available after the session so that, um, uh, because there's too much information here to, to process just uh, in the time we've got available. Um, there are manual dexterity examples. There are physical coordination examples. Uh, ability to lift, carry, or otherwise move everyday objects. And um, here we can see these are relatively light objects that it's talking about, books, kettles, light furniture. Speech, hearing, eyesight, of course, while wearing spectacles or contact lenses, if you can correct your vision, then uh, you don't have a disability for these purposes memory, ability to concentrate, learn or understand. So um, all of these um, guidance um, are quite helpful, I think, um, because it's important to recognise that 
what Ogdenate is trying to do is to um, is to make it a bit more difficult to meet the definition of disability. And I think this probably goes hand in hand with the approach that's being taken to where you depart from the discount factors. And I'll come on to that in a minute. So far as the reduction factors themselves are concerned, the um, first thing is that they've been recalculated at a discount rate of zero. And this is to reflect changes in the um, discount rate. Um, it might seem a bit eccentric to have done this to zero. And the reason is that the data isn't available to provide reduction factors at minus 0.25%. And the guidance note says that um, any difference is thought to be negligible uh, between 0.25% and 0 for these purposes. So that's the first change. And the um, second is how education is dealt with. So um, educational qualifications are now split into three levels. And um, what's quite useful is that the, um, there's a lot more um, explanation about which qualifications fall in which uh, levels. And it is worth looking at this to see what they are because uh, we're given really a very helpful breakdown using a lot of different and vocational qualifications as well to, to say where somebody fits um, in an individual section. So for example, level three, higher degree, degree or equivalent, higher education qualification below degree level. It then gives us specific um, examples here. Um, level seven diploma, for example, level seven certificate, NVQ level four, um, level five certificate, various teaching qualifications. I'm not going to read them all out, but um, it is um, going to make it a lot easier when you know what a particular claimant's um, education is. And if they have um, various different qualifications, we can see from these where these fit in these three levels. So um, that actually does make um, the task of applying these tables quite a lot easier. The, as I said, um, one of the most interesting and potentially uh, controversial parts of um, Ogdenate is the guidance about departing from the reduction factors. And this raises um, fundamental issues uh, because, of course, in any given case, we're looking at a particular claimant with his or her own very individual and particular circumstances. But the table A to D approach is based on the surveyed population as a whole. So necessarily, um, it's not going to be exactly right for any given claimant. And the guidance notes recognise that and, and, and do accept that it is in the nature of assessing damages that a single estimate based on a group average will be inaccurate for an individual claimant. And then they say a certain degree of inaccuracy must be accepted. And nonetheless, um, the Ogden guidance um, does provide very strong encouragement to um, judges to use the table A to D approach. And I've um, put some of the quotes um, about that on here. It's saying that it's the suggested method for dealing with contingencies other than mortality. It's applicable in most circumstances. Um, the fact that there are uncertainties about the future doesn't of itself justify a departure from multiplicand multiplier approach. Judges should be slow to resort to broad brush blameire approach unless they have no alternative. In fact, unless they really have no alternative. And that the table A to D reduction factors should generally be used unless there's a good reason to disapply or to adjust them. And this is something of a departure from Ogden 7. Um, this was previously described as being a ready reckoner and that um, wording has come out. And um, as I um, said when I was talking about the de uh, definition of disability, I think perhaps this goes hand in hand with a uh, stricter definition of disability and greater encouragement on judges to actually use the table A to D uh, approach where disability is found. Now there is some um, guidance about um, departing from the um, A to D table approach, or at least the strict approach. And um, these really fall in these four categories that I put here on the slide. So looking at the education uh, example, um, there were some 
quite useful things put in here. So, for example, it says that you may have a claimant who dropped out of education early for what they describe as a positive reason, such as a job offer. So you might have somebody who um, doesn't have um, the highest uh, education level, but has um, left school early to do a really good job and had a very successful career since then. And um, the guidance suggests that for such a person, uh, it may well be appropriate to use a higher education category to reflect their um, reduction factor than their strict qualifications would suggest. It also notes that there are going to be some claimants who have uh, educational attainment which is very close to the border between one level and another. And if you have a person like that who's only just in uh, level two or level three, that um, looking at their uh, educational attainment, it might be appropriate to put them in a lower level, even though they might strictly just meet the higher level. It also suggests that in a case like that, it may be uh, better to make a small adjustment rather than actually um, apply the figures for an entirely different category. It also notes that um, individual claimants do face different employment risks depending on their own um, employment position. And this is the second uh, bullet point on here, which I called employment. Because if a claimant's in a very established job, they face a much lower employment risk than a particular claimant with a checkered work history who just happens to be in work at the time of the trial or the settlement. And I think that is really important. And the guidance is suggesting that if you have a situation like that, those are the two extremes. A claimant with a particularly uh, safe job and a particularly low employment risk, that's one adjustment that you might need to make to show this. And then somebody else who happens to be in work but has an extremely checkered work history you might need an adjustment to make the reduction a bit bigger. Uh, it also um, gives the example of somebody who might have high uh, educational qualifications and skills, but who by reason of their uh, injury is unable to make use of their um, highest uh, skills or education. And um, it suggests that if you have a person in that situation, you should apply the educational level appropriate, not to the education that they actually have, but the education that they're actually able to use, because it's um, these things don't just work in the abstract. It's the interaction between the educational level and employment that's important. So um, if you have, um, for example, a highly skilled and qualified nurse who can't do that anymore and has to do a lower skilled job, then you need to apply the educational level appropriate to that. Um, but it's disability itself that really is going to be the one where, um, where certainly defendants are the keenest to make adjustments to the, uh, to the um, strict A to D table approach. And what the guidance says about that is that the most important thing to consider is what is the impact of the disability on this particular claimant. For example, uh, if you have somebody in a clerical job who has a leg amputation, that would clearly be a disability for often purposes, but that's going to make much less difference to their work than if the claimant was a manual worker. And um, to my mind, that's the most um, significant um, aspect here. You have to really look at the effect of the impairment on this particular claimant and their work and um, see what difference that's going to make to them. So in this section, it's really the meaning of um, disability and the guidance about departing from the reduction factors that um, are the most significant changes, I think, and the ones that are going to need the most careful look at in, uh, in a given case. And with that, I'm going to um, pass you back to, um, I hope, to um, Chris. Are you still there? Yes, indeed. Hopefully, I can share my screen. And um, someone, I'm sure, will let me know if there's something bizarre has come up. But 
Thank you, Andrew. I'm going to take everybody through the changes to the multipliers in Ogden 8 due to life expectancy um, and also the expanded commentary we have um, in respect of impaired life expectancy. Um, so first of all, in terms of life expectancy generally, um, it has apparently gone down. Um, Ogden 8 is based on the 2018 mortality data from the Office of National Statistics, which was published in December last year. Um, the effect generally is that multipliers in the tables will be slightly lower, um, particularly for losses after retirement age. Um, and the older the claimant, um, the higher the percentage difference on their damages will be. Um, it's perhaps not the most welcome news on a Tuesday morning, that as Paul said earlier, we are working later and retiring nearer to 70, um, but not living quite as long. Um, the introduction to the notes uh, acknowledges this and states that for younger claimants, the approximate reduction in life expectancy between the two additions is approximately one year for men and two years for women. Um, this reflects a difference in overall predicted life expectancy of one to two percent. Um, but for older claimants, the difference in predicted life expectancy can be as much as eight to nine percent. Um, Overall, I think the lower multipliers, they're likely to have a modest effect um, in the majority of cases, um, but there will be cases where they could have quite a significant effect. Um, in terms of the practical implications of the change, uh, there may be schedules and counter schedules out there uh, which need to be redone. Um, and of course, that work may not have been budgeted for. So they may might require an application to amend your cost budget. Um, and also in terms of Part 36 offers, uh, they should be reviewed, they may need to be withdrawn, um, or in fact some of them may now need to be given much more serious consideration. Uh, the mortality predictions which Ogden 8 is, uh, is based on, they don't take any account of the current pandemic. Um, the notes at the start acknowledge that the long-term effect of the pandemic is simply unknown at the moment, um, but they suggest that it's likely to have a limited long-term effect. Um, the next edition of Ogden, I think, is expected in four to five years, years time. So we'll have to wait and see whether there has been an impact. Um, these are some examples just to give you a flavour of the extent of the differences in multipliers, um, which we'll be using over the coming years. So Boris is 60 today. You can see that under Ogden 7, his lifetime multiplier would have been 25.92 under Ogden 8. 24.76, so you can see a roughly one year reduction. Um, and then by way of another example, his eldest daughter is 27, also today, um, 63.29 versus 61.58. Um, I've set out a couple more examples there just to give you an idea of the kind of change in the numbers. Um, and then to add some context to it, if we assume that Boris has a claim and one of the heads of claim involves an annual loss of £125,000. You can see that under Ogden 7, that equated to 3.24 million, whereas under Ogden 8, we're looking at just under 3.1 million, um, a difference of £145,000, which is relatively significant. Um, you'll get the slides afterwards, but I've done the same for the other three examples. Um, that those figures there are the difference between an annual claim of £125,000 um, between Ogden 7 and Ogden 8. So turning then to impaired life expectancy, um, as I'm sure everyone is familiar with, the determining the extent to which a claimant's life has been cut down by their injuries is a very significant feature of the assessment of damages. Um, and life expectancy can also be affected by other factors in addition to the, in to the injury. Um, it's quite crucial when determining the multiplier which is going to be used um, when you're looking at life expectancy, because often cases involving curtailed life expectancy, you're often applying those multipliers to quite large sums of money. And Ogden 8 has quite an extensive set of new commentary on when the court is entitled to conclude that a claimant's life expectancy is atypical. So what I propose to do is go through some of the key points now. These are all found in the explanatory notes um, at paragraphs 8 to 13. 
as they say, the tables are based upon the average or typical male and female life expectancy, which is assumed claimants will have unless proved otherwise. The mortality assumptions relate to the population of the UK as a whole. There's no increase or reduction is required unless there is clear evidence that C is atypical to a greater extent than would be encompassed by reasonable variations from factors such as residence lifestyle, educational level, etc. Um, it reminds us that the courts view the assessment of life expectancy essentially as a medical issue and it acknowledges that a claimant may have atypical life expectancy not just because of the injury but because of other factors and when determining life expectancy a court must take all factors relevant to that claimant into account. Um, one issue that arises is how to deal with a situation where a claimant has, other, has factors other than the injury um, which are likely to affect their life expectancy. So such as a serious smoking habit or several years of heavy drinking, um, various levels of obesity, etc. Paragraph 12 to the explanatory notes says that whilst there's no definition of what constitutes atypical, the courts have generally been reluctant to admit expert evidence to argue for a different life expectancy solely on the basis of lifestyle factors since the average in the tables includes smokers, non-smokers, drinkers, teetotalers, uh, etc. Uh, and it cites and references that the case of Dodds and Arif from last year. Um, this is just a very high level reminder of the approach to medical evidence. Um, the leading case is Raw Victoria Infirmatory from 2002. And when a court is determining life expectancy, it's done by reference to the general life tables in the ordinary run of cases and on the basis of medical evidence in special cases. Statistics are a useful tool but should not displace the expertise of the clinician. Um, what Dodds and Arif from last year tells us is that there is a restrictive approach to statistical evidence um, and it should really only be used where the clinical experts can't offer an opinion on life expectancy um, whether they recommend statistical evidence or they disagree on the proper approach to it. Um, so some short thoughts on the new commentary. Uh, it could be said that it potentially downplays uh, the primacy of medical opinion um, and it raises the issue as to whether or not, of course, the assertion that, for example, heavy smoking or drinking should not lead to an alteration in life expectancy, um, is that really justifiable? I think most people's experiences will be that physicians do generally deduct a significant period uh, where a person has lengthy or moderate smoking history, for example, um, even if they've, they've stopped. Um, they do appear to feel that such history would take a person outside of the norm. Um, now, the final point in this section, there is some expanded commentary and guidance on the appropriate method of determining life multipliers where you have impaired life expectancy. Those are found in the explanatory notes of paragraphs 14 to 17. And what, what it says is that once it's determined that a claimant has atypical life expectancy, you have to decide the appropriate multiplier either by using tables one and two, which do take account of mortality adjustments, um, or you look at table 36, which was previously table 28, um, which doesn't take account. Um, of mortality. Um, the, the new notes provide a couple of examples, um, but just to sum up the issue, there is a difference between a situation where experts are attempting to give a clinical judgment as to the age to which an individual is likely to live, in which case table 36 would be appropriate, and a situation where experts are attempting to give an average deduction in respect of people with similar injuries to the claimant from the average normal life expectancy without making any allowance for non-injury related factors, in which case you'd be using table one or two. Uh, the examples from the notes, the first one is paragraph 15. The common example of this is the development of epilepsy following a traumatic brain injury, which results which reduces the claimant's life expectancy by a few years compared to the average. 
In such a case, table one or two may be used to calculate the approximate lifetime multiplier by deeming the claimant to be older than his or her actual age by the same number of years which his or her life expectancy has been reduced. And then in other cases, the court may make a finding that the claimant has a given life expectancy based upon his or her mortality risks as a whole. And, find, and, and that finding will have involved a more extensive and refined exercise which examines all of the claimant's mortality risks and therefore renders it inappropriate to regard him as one of the class who is subject to the statistical mortality risks which are provided for in tables one and two. So in a case like that, it would be table 36. Um, just finally, the last explanatory note to this section makes the point that when you're using table 36, it will understate the multiplier when the discount rate is negative uh, and also overstate it when it's positive. Um, because it doesn't take account of mortality. Um, provided though that the discount rate is close to zero, the difference is said to be negligible. Um, of course, though, if there is a subsequent change in the discount rate over the coming years, um, that will need to be looked at. And in those circumstances, Ogdenate recommends a different method to be used, um, which is the one found in Ogden 6 at paragraph 20. Um, could also be relevant for Northern Ireland cases at the moment. Northern Ireland currently has a discount rate of 0.25% um, and it is potentially going to change to minus 1.75%. So you can see how it may be relevant there. Um, with that, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and pass you over to Francesca. Do let me know if that hasn't worked. I think it has worked and I am just going to start my slideshow now. I hope everyone can see that now. Good morning everyone, I'm Francesca O'Neill. Obviously we've saved the best till last um, in terms of um, this presentation but I realise that you have all been rather bombarded with information so what I'm proposed to do is to take you through some of the impact of the new Ogden 8 tables on fatal cases, but you'll see that the slides are relatively full. Please don't panic. We are going to share these slides with you at the end of the presentation. I'm not going to read them out to you. What I have tried to do is to provide you with a useful, a hopefully useful guide as to where you will find the relevant explanatory notes in the new tables. And so that it's much easier for you to assess whether the changes will have any impact on any ongoing fatal cases that you are dealing with or are likely to deal with in the near future. So what is the main change here today? The impact on fatal cases is really the application to the tables of the decision in a case which most of you will be familiar with in any case, NAWA and the Ministry of Justice, a 2016 decision. That said, that the correct date as at which to assess the multiplier when fixing damages for future loss in claims under the Fatal Accidents Act 1976 should be the date of trial and not the date of death. And many of you will recall that there was a great deal of confusion about that point and a great deal of argument about it before it was crystallised. Um, so that is really the fundamental change here. What I'm going to do in the next few slides is quite quickly take you through my guide to the explanatory notes, um, which I'm hoping will save you all time when you are calculating um, various new losses according to the new tables. So they start really at, at number 128 and from 128 to 133 is the basic methodology for calculating dependencies. Um, and it's explained in quite a lot of detail. And actually, I'm sure I'll be rubbished if I'm wrong about this, but um, I found that these explanatory notes were quite full, quite detailed and quite useful. Um, and although we're dealing with quite a complicated bit of practice, um, I certainly found that when I read them carefully, I understood a great deal more about how to use uh, the tables in this particular area. So, I mean, for example, it deals with dependents, earnings, pensions, benefits, 
the loss of services, including things like DIY and childcare, for pre-trial losses, the actual loss to the date of trial is calculated, and then post-trial losses are calculated as at the date of trial, referring back to NAWA. At 134, you have a, a method for calculating pre-trial dependency. This will normally run from the date of the incident causing the fatal injuries if death is delayed, where the deceased's death is delayed, although not where, for example, uh, the deceased is paid by an employer. It's a really cheery stuff to end this talk with, sorry. Um, but caution here, and I have flagged it up, don't double count with a claim under the Miscellaneous Act 1934 um, Act because you'll get in trouble, especially in respect of income dependency. So just watch, watch out for that. Um, it's, it's easy to do because you're using two different methods. Um, if you go over then to 135, you'll see that there's an, an explanation of the application of, table, of the table E factor to years to trial. So factors are now given for one to 10 years rather than at the incremental three, six, nine years, which again, I think adds um, a level of accuracy, which was perhaps slightly missing and, and, and led to some unfortunate complications using Ogden 7. So I think that's been quite a useful development. Um, one through six, don't forget to add interest. One three seven to one three eight types of post-trial dependency, all calculated now using the same methodology, um, which again, I think is quite useful. Don't worry, I'm not going to read this whole slide out to you, but it just shows you where you can find in those explanatory notes, the guidance on um, how to go through these stages of the calculation. So a starting point, the shorter of the period for which the deceased would have provided and for which the dependent would have received income and services, discounts for contingencies, the factors, deductions and adjustments that you will need to apply to those, contingencies and pensions, whether a relationship like a marriage would have survived. All of these are factors that you will be used to taking into account when doing these calculations. So there's nothing really wildly new or innovative about it. It's just set out, um, I think, in quite a useful way. Steps for calculating the post-trial dependency. And then this is something that I have struggled with in the past and I think it's really useful that it's now set out how to calculate multiple dependencies so you can either use a single multiplier or different multipliers if the dependencies are independent of each other um, really quite useful obviously this isn't always the case with income but it might be with some services I can think of examples where childcare is provided to families of two offspring separately so just to bear in mind that this guidance, although detailed, is actually really going to be very useful to you when you're confronted with some of the slightly knottier um, issues in calculating um, post-death dependencies. And then I think um, most usefully for all of us practitioners who actually have to use the tables and apply them to quite complicated factual issues at 145 to 60 are a series of examples. Some of them are more opaque than others. I can see Paul kind of grimacing <laughs> at, these, at these examples, but um, I've just selected the first example as one to take you through today. I think that they are quite useful because they actually give you a stage by stage breakdown of how you apply the tables and the new calculations to your particular circumstance. So in the first example, for example, the sole financial dependent is a woman aged 38 at the date of the trial, which is taking place three years after the date of a fatal accident, which killed her husband, who at that time was aged 37. Again, I'm not going to read this out. I've copied it from the explanatory notes. You will find this example and all the other examples set out there. But for the benefit of having at least one example in these slides, I thought it useful to have the full thing. This takes you effectively through all of the points of information that you are going to have to collate in order to be able to use the tables. So we have the age at the date of trial of the deceased, obviously, what the educational level was, what the employment status was, disabled or not, 
where and where this person lived and worked um, and so what the discount rate is evidence of atypical mortality risks or an unstable relationship a multiplicand calculation has already been done to divine what the normal retirement age would be 65 decided that the post-retirement damages should be payable based on a multiplicand of twelve thousand pounds and the multipliers in the example are taken from the ogden tables one to 34 no interpolation required you'll all be thrilled to know so how do you do it then the pre-trial damages are calculated as shown below what is the period between the fatal accident and the trial three years adjust for the risk of possible early death considered negligible as the deceased was under 40 so you apply the adjustment factor what are the pre-trial damages earnings of thirty thousand pounds times three years times one ninety thousand pounds straightforward plus interest as special damages remember how i said don't forget your interest what is the interest rate half rate date of death to date of trial simple calculation again nothing too innovative there um, gets a little bit more complicated when you look at post-trial damages because of course this is split between the pre and post retirement damages levels again not going to take you not going to read this out for you but it shows you very helpfully i think in stages how you can identify the correct multipliers for use so the expected period for which the dependent would have been able to receive the dependency working out the age from then to retirement the multiplier for a male aged 40 retiring at 65 adjusting for contingencies other than mortality adjust for the risk that the deceased might have died anyway before the date of trial again in this example considered negligible as the deceased was under 40 so it gives you the correct adjustment factor and finally the post-trial pre-retirement damages total shows you the calculation and how you reach the final figure post-trial post-retirement damages are calculated as set out below again all of this is in the explanatory notes along with all of the other examples so again it's really a mathematical formula and it shows you um, again in great detail and step by step how you will achieve the correct calculation so expectation of life expected period the lesser of the two periods the multiplier from age 65 for a male age 40 again adjusting for the risk but again considered negligible but it gives you at least the adjustment factor that you need and then again you've got your multiplier it's a fairly simple um, calculation so uh, yes the total financial dependency is therefore 90 plus interest plus 651600 plus 271920 gives you just a little bit more than a million pounds obviously um, I hope that that is actually fairly straightforward for all of you but I, I think it's actually more useful sometimes to go through an example like that where you can see how in practice you are applying something that quite often scares practitioners especially when there's a new shiny version of it you might think oh I'm not going to even I just I can't even start to delve into these explanatory notes it's it's going to be too complicated it is complicated but the explanatory notes are your friend um, and they will help you to get to the right point i think ooh, hang on thank you for listening um all of our details are on this screen so if you have any questions arising from any of the separate sections of this presentation you shouldn't hesitate to email any one of us and we will do our best to respond but of course there is a question and answer function as part of this presentation now and so what i'm going to do is leave this um, screen up so that you've got our details but i think if everybody unmutes themselves and um, perhaps we can um, see if there are any questions um, that we can answer straight away thank you francesca um as as francesca said um we, we do have a q a button to button to press uh, we've actually only had one question during the uh, seminar so that shows either we've explained it so well uh, <laughs> there's not any questions uh, or it, or it means that everyone's hopelessly confused hopefully it's the former uh, the question we did have was from uh, hugh ponting 
Uh, Hugh asked this question, do you feel that the Disability Discrimination Act definition adequately co covers cognitive and executive related disabilities such as hidden disability, taking into account the limited reference to memory um, in Andrew's slide? And, and my reply was, I think Hugh has a very good point. Um, the DDA factors really focus uh, more on physical disabilities than non-physical disabilities. Uh, and importantly, is of course, uh, and this was uh, from my days doing employment law, I seem to recall this was a factor uh, of argument. Uh, the fact that you weren't able to work in a particular capacity uh, didn't used to be treated as making you disabled within the meaning of the act itself. So you may have um, uh, you may have hidden disabilities such as those to which Hugh refers uh, without necessarily satisfying uh, the criteria about memory in the, in, in the criteria. So what you would do from the claimant's point of view in this situation, it seems to me, is argue for a departure from tables A to B, A to D. Most, uh, most of the case law says that you depart in favour of the defendant, but there's no reason at all why you shouldn't uh, argue for a departure in the claimant's favour. Uh, and you would say that although my client is not uh, obviously uh, within the DDA definition, nevertheless, because we are focusing here on his ability to work, uh, we ought to uh, be uh, giving him a low table A, fa a low table A to D factor or, uh, for the uh, for his um, uh, earning capacity in the future, and that obviously will result in an increased award. So, uh, interesting question there from Hugh. Thank you very much for that, indeed, Hugh. Uh, and as Francesca said at the end, you have our email addresses. We are always extremely happy to be contacted for any for an informal discussion about any concerns that you may have about any of your cases uh, but we hope you found this trawl through Ogdenate interesting we've taken that we've taken about an hour uh, thank you very much indeed for your patience today uh, and we hope that you found it useful we will be publishing uh, the slides on our website and we'll also uh, this will also go online just one point uh, typically enough with anyone who uses excel i realized that in one of my tables the references were slightly out, um, so the, uh, the the table that showed how to split a multiplier uh, will will contain some slightly different numbers in the final version that's published. However, the principles I expounded upon remain the same. Uh, but to anyone who spotted that, uh, have a pr uh, there's no prize for that, I'm afraid. It wasn't deliberate, uh, but uh, do do check that amended version, uh, uh, which will be available online. Thank you very much indeed for your time, everybody, uh, and uh, we. Uh, Hope to get the chance to speak with some of you again in the future. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank, thank you very, very much, everybody. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.